Welcome again to another episode of TOSP, the official Cyblogs podcast. I'm Elf, one of your hosts, and unfortunately, Amy's skiving off this week. She's away at Ada Camp, which we'll come back to later on. Uh, but in her place, we have another very special guest today. Her name is Haritina Mogoshanu. Uh, she's a great personal friend of mine, a co-host of the World Space Week podcast, which we write and produce together. And she's also manager of educational relations for the World Space Week Association. Welcome, Haritina. Thank you very much, Elf. Now, Harry, what else do you do? Just just give us a, a brief list. <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of things. I love science. I am a senior advisor for the um, science and risk assessment group of the biosecurity, of MAC Biosecurity. I am also publicity officer for the Royal Astronomical Society of New Zealand, and I am coordinating the education relations for the Kiwi Space Foundation, where we promote space to people. All right, fantastic. It sounds like you're almost as busy as Amy and I. <laughs> well, I love what I do, so it's not busy. It's just being there. Doing what you love. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll come back to some of the other things you do a wee bit later on because they're kind of interesting, I think, just a little bit. Uh, but to start us off, I believe you have an article about exoplanets. Yes, and how wonderful is that? The latest news from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at California Institute of Technology is telling us that a study shown that there are at least a hundred billion planets in our galaxy. And 20 years ago, I remember Carl Sagan saying that there are about 100 billion neurons in our brains. This is what they measured at the time. So that means we have as many neurons in our brains as planets are in our galaxy. And I think this is fascinating. That's great. And about, I think from the study, it also says that about 10% of those uh, planets are terrestrial or vaguely habitable. And I guess that's kind of similar to 10% of neurons in our brains that we actually use. Ah, uh-huh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is a seriously cool study. This is uh, a much more definite number than they've had before because they used a bunch of different uh, planetary discovery techniques. So the, the main one they tend to use is microlensing, which is the focusing of light from a star by a planet passing in front of it. But they also corroborate this with a bunch of other planetary detection techniques um, that are really cool. So they've got a really, really good idea of just how many planets there are in our galaxy. You know what I find very interesting? It's the fact that they've recently said that a sun, that a star having planets is the norm rather than not having planets, which I think is fantastic. Yeah, and the other big result from this survey, which is right along those lines, is that um, about so two thirds of the stars in our galaxy have Earth mass planets, and this is a lot more than we've previously thought. So this means that smaller planets are far more common than big planets. And traditionally, most of the exoplanets that we've discovered and characterised have been pretty big, about the size of Saturn or Jupiter, because big planets are easy to find. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Much easier to spot. Um, so I think uh, what the the result the result sorry that they quote in this paper is that that means that within 50 light years of Earth, so that's similar to the radiosphere, it's a little bit smaller, um, and sorry, the radiosphere is the distance around the Earth, like a big expanding bubble around the Earth that our radio signals have actually reached since we started sending them about Do you mean our TV shows? <laughs> yeah, well, not, our TV shows took a wee bit longer to get there, so they started going out in about the 60s, right? This is, this is slightly before that, this is those still kind of... nuclear explosions? Yeah, those kind of things. That's the, the, our first transmission to the stars. Yay, humanity! Um, but that means that within that bubble is about 1,500 planets. So there's 1,500 planets so far that are probably, if there's intelligent life on them, that might be aware of human beings. But that's 1,500 out of 100 billion. Wow. <laughs> It's just like nothing. We've we've contacted nothing of the universe. It's it's a ridiculously small percentage. Well, we have time. <laughs> yeah. Well, you speak for yourself. <laughs> Four and a half billion years sounds like a good amount of time to me. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, 
like it, like it comes with a beautiful Drake equation that predicts uh, how uh, the probability of us interacting with intelligent life on all these other worlds. What it comes down to isn't the number of planets in the in the galaxy or number of stars in the galaxy or the speed of light or uh, how technically advanced the civilization is. It's how long a technically advanced civilization can survive for that really makes that equation either completely improbable or totally and utterly probable. And if our listeners wish to find this out for themselves, they can go to Carter Observatory. They've got that equation on a wall. <laughs> it's a shameless self-plug. Haratini actually uh, designed most of those uh, exhibits, and she definitely wrote that calculation program for the Drake equation, didn't you? Oh, just the frame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's 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 fun. I love the Drake equation. Although mathematicians do tend to re- refer to it as uh, an equation, figuring out how much bullshit people will accept if you put it in mathematical form. <laughs> they will. They will. <laughs> Completely. All right. So uh, next on our list of articles today is something slightly different. Again, it's got a, a weird, spacey kind of feel to it, but it's at the other end of the length scale. So a study published in the January 8 edition of Nature this year uh, by a team of scientists from the University of Chicago and the University of Oregon uh, have used mutations and studies of one single protein, and this is a pore protein, so it's a little, uh, it's like a little gate that sits in the, the wall of biological cells. They've looked at that protein, they've looked at all the little bits that make it up, and they've mapped them out across all the distant all different species, and they've used that to construct almost a, a tree of life for this particular protein. The reason this is interesting, so bits of this has been done before, but the reason this particular one is interesting is that this is the first time it's been done on all components of a protein. And this has allowed them to map out the changes in this protein uh, as far back as 800 million years ago. So they can actually, by, by looking at this protein in different organisms today, so it's in things like fungi and bacteria and human beings and ducks and everything else in between, uh, by looking at the changes between those, they can read out the history. And the cool thing is that you see, what they see, what they observe, is that this protein gets more complex as time goes on. And that's, that's kind of what you might expect through evolution, kind of. But the way it gets more complex is that it gets more specific. So uh, they've actually managed to recreate the original protein from about 800 million years ago by uh, using genetic engineering techniques and sticking together different bits of protein from different species today. And they've found that the ancient protein works in all sorts of different cells and it works to transport all sorts of different things. But in that 800 million years since that protein was actually around and living and existing, it's specialized so that the one you find in humans won't be able to also work in fungi, which is, is obvious now that I say it. But that, uh, the fact that this protein used to be in use by all sorts of different organisms, it's a really interesting idea that it's got more complex by becoming able to do less. It's got more useless junk on it now. You could kind of think of it like that. And it's just a really beautiful study. I can't wait to see uh, applying this to other, uh, other molecular, molecular machines as well. And they can, they can see the individual mutation events that actually map out the history of this protein. So one particular one, so this is shaped a, a bit like a, a cylinder. It's literally a cylinder that sticks in a cell wall. And one of the important... Uh, modifications they've found of this is that originally it used to have it used to be like two Lego blocks that stuck together but uh, a few million years ago uh, by accident it changed from in some species sorry it changed from two Lego blocks to three Lego blocks and the three Lego block version doesn't work as well as the two Lego block version uh, for most things but for some things it's far far better and so ever since then uh, they've had a diversion in the evolutionary paths of the, the two Lego block protein or the three Lego block protein. And one of them has ended up almost exclusively in fungi, and the other one is through all sorts of, all sorts of other eukaryotes. And it's just, it's absolutely incredible. It's fascinating. But you talk about complexity and you talk about complicating our lives. I can give you an example from astronomy I was thinking about this week. We created calendars. 
and we created lunar calendars. Those were our first calendars in the history of the humankind. And they were okay. The calendars were working for the people living in the equatorial regions, uh, people who live from Kenya, the people from Middle Asia, from wherever our migratory path drove us. And they were measuring the time by the moon, by just looking at the cycle of the moon. Now, we went to Europe, and Europe is very cold. There is a blanket of snow that stays there for three months, and there is nothing else to measure the time, just the stars. So we invented that's the sidereal calendars. So people measured the time by the stars now. Now, we came back here to Polynesia. We came back here to the southern part, to the Chinese, to the Muslims, to the um, Israeli. We gave them the sidereal calendars, and they didn't need them. It's... <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, it's this idea of uh, degeneracy in biology, so, so multiple different things having the same function and things becoming completely unnecessary. You bringing all this baggage along with you, uh, oftentimes because it does become useful some way in the future. <laughs> and and so. it's about how many how many options you have. If we have lots of options, it is normal that through evolution, some of these options are cut out. And we don't know whether they're the good options or the bad options. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely understand what you mean. <laughs> it's um, Well, I guess you have to say that, that evolution usually selects for the good options, right? But, the but good not options necessarily... That, yeah, but the good options that are interesting and useful to that particular situation and we don't know how many of the good genes were erased just because another gene that say for instance was involved with the survival through cold was necessary so then everything else went away Ah, uh, yeah but this is where you have and um oh, the, the term is is escaping me it's called for having two alleles, multiple alleles, rather than having one uh, that allows you to store genetic information that uh, isn't possibly as suited to, uh, you know, you can, you can store genetic information without expressing it. Um, sorry, the, the term is completely escaping me at the moment. But, and the idea that this allows evolution to occur so much more quickly and allows it to diversify rather rapidly by having this kind of evolutionary baggage on the shoulder. It's beautiful. I love it. It's such a gorgeous system. It is. <laughs> anyway, so um, on to our next article. Uh, this is another spacey one. We're very spacey today because uh, Haratina is our guest. So this is, uh, this was again from Nature. This was, oh, sorry, no, it's from the Astrophysical Journal. It's a new study that has produced the biggest three-dimensional color map of all of the galaxies in the universe. So since the year 2000, we've been doing this, and it's known as the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, and they've had three different iterations of this. And this particular one that I'm mentioning now is the third iteration. And this looks for millions of galaxies at ridiculous distances from the Earth. So we're not talking tens or hundreds or thousands or millions of light years, these are billions of light years away, which also means that we're seeing them billions of years back in time. Uh, this particular study is the biggest and most, um, m most statistically significant study that's been done so far. And what they're doing is they're not only mapping out the universe, they're also looking at the redshift of these galaxies. And the, the redshift is an indicator of how fast away from us that these galaxies are moving. And that tells you how quickly the universe is inflating. But what they've done with this new iteration is they've, they've added in uh, a bunch of other observations from sorry, uh, the Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, or BOSS for short, which detects baryon acoustic oscillations. Baryons are matter, normal matter, like what make up you and me, and you have uh, leptons and other weird things, but baryons is a astrophysics, particle physics term for normal stuff, and acoustic oscillations are sound waves, as you might expect. So what this particular study is doing is it's not just looking at how fast these galaxies are moving, it's looking at the position of these galaxies and small changes 
left over in the background radiation in the universe, which is left over from the Big Bang. And it's looking at the relationship between the two. Wow. And they find a gorgeous link between where galaxies are clustered and how galaxies are clustered together very, very far away in the universe and small changes in the microwave background radiation. And so uh, this is further evidence that... um, promotes the relationship between very ridiculously tiny changes in the early universe leading to the formation of galaxies and supergalactic structures and all of the complexity in our universe today. And it's amazing because they go further than that. They use this to measure the expansion of the universe. And we believe that the expansion of the universe is is pushed at the moment, or we call it pushed because it's happening much faster than we would expect. And this is where the idea of dark energy comes from. It's the idea that the universe is inflating uh, much more quickly than we would expect. So we say that there must be some force, some energy causing it to inflate, and that's what dark energy is. And so they use this technique in the surveys of these 900,000 galaxies to calculate the amount of dark energy in the universe. And it comes out as 73% of all of the energy in the universe is dark energy. So this is energy that we can't see and that we don't know exists in any way other than the expansion of the universe, which I think is is pretty cool. It boggles my mind, and I do not understand the complete implications of this, but it's a really really interesting study. And it took a whole bunch of computational stuff. If you're interested in the details, as usual, we'll put the link up in the show notes, but it's very, very cool. Yeah, it blew my mind as well. I don't know what to comment on this. <laughs> also, there's a pretty picture, and we've now, using this technique, we've now um, observed, what is it? Da, 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 da. I think it's about 60%, 60% of the entire night sky. I'll confirm that number later on. <laughs> uh, but it's a phenomenal amount of the night sky that we've actually managed to, to look at so far. It's absolutely incredible, and I can't wait to see uh, version 4, <laughs> yeah. especially especially when we start putting in uh, data from the Square Kilometre Array or any of the other deep space telescopes that and, might go up if their funding doesn't cave in. And the thing is, if you look at the picture, so many galaxies are in there, and in those galaxies, so many planets probably have developed to host life. And it's just impossible not to say that there might be life somewhere in this universe. Uh, I, I agree with you, Harry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure how... Uh, but it's so how... far away, and because we don't see it, it just almost means that it doesn't exist for us. Well, it doesn't exist for us, right? Because a lot of these galaxies, because they're billions of light years away, essentially, relative to us and how we're seeing it, uh, it's, it's a, a isolated from us by tens of billions of years in some cases. And so, you know, (laughs) this isn't even talking about us traveling there. This is just us watching what's going on. We're seeing it as it was 10 billion years ago. So galaxies haven't had time to evolve or develop into a stable state that is required to produce small stars like our sun. Sorry, our sun's reasonable size. Um, And you need those stars to get planets. So, (laughs) I mean, and as those... Sorry, go on. No, I said, however, one can look at the universe and make beautiful poetry. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) There's just the problem that everything we look at, which is this far away, hasn't had time to evolve to the state that we require to have life yet. So it's really hard to say. (laughs) And they could be having exactly the same discussion about us, but there's this kind of temporal isolation between us two, which is a bit of a shame. But... No, we just I think we need to survive. If we survive for a few billion years, everything will become clear. Oh, there is a temporal isolation even if you go to the States because you go there and you're one day later. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, a different kind of temporal isolation. <laughs> <laughs> you can still talk to people and you only get a very, very small delay in the conversation because of temporal isolation. Yes, but they're Whereas if you were prank them. Uh, yeah, but that's... that's it's a human construct. That's not a fundamental physical law. There's, there's not. It doesn't take the. It doesn't take light a day to travel from here to the other side of the world, <laughs> which is the temporal isolation I was talking about. Human beings don't deal with time particularly well, so we have to divide it up into these arbitrary lunar calendars. Yeah, we never have time. <laughs> 
Indeed. And so moving right along, uh, our next article is uh, an article from Cyblogs this week. And again, we've decided to pick up one from Alison Campbell, who writes Bioblog. And this week, I picked this one up because it's a subject I'm particularly passionate about. Alison's reposted a quote that I'll read out from um, an original blog post by Seth Mnookin uh, from Huffington Post Science Section. And essentially, what he says is that what our mainstream science education curricula fails to adequately teach is why the process of science tends to produce information of relatively high reliability and why this process is such useful compensation for human limitations. And Allison mentions it as, as part of a discussion uh, with particular re reference to homeopathy and, and other bits and pieces, but it's certainly sentiments I really, really agree with, because to many people, science is just another way of looking at the world. And I used to, I used to believe this myself for a long period of time. It was just like another set of beliefs. But it is slightly, or it is completely different to that, because it requires you to change your belief depending on observations. And one of the problems with this, and I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, Twiv, long-time listeners will know that I always love This Week in Virology. One of the big problems that they have in science and communicating science to the public is that any non-scientific thing, you can come out and you can say with certainty that this is happening or that this is not happening. But you don't get that in science. You get these different degrees of, of certainty and changes and that's the complex bit is that you can never say definitively whether something is or isn't whereas the public tends to perceive science as a collection of facts and it's not like that at all i think we should <laughs> talk about knowledge rather than beliefs where knowledge is what we believe is true so it's this intersection of the facts that we discover and how much we believe they're true and this is science science provides knowledge but there is also another aspect of people wanting to take the shortcut for everything easy recipe for a lot of things that we're doing because it's just easier this way we do not have time to look too deep into the things some other time we just prefer to relate to a subject that sounds a little bit like what we wanted the final result to be. And I believe that, <laughs> I believe that <laughs> this is the reason why pseudoscience has such a big um, hook for, for a lot of people. And it's hard. Science is hard. You have to spend endless nights by the computer, by the book. You have to read a lot. You have to study. And the other problem with the science that I, I also believe it's, uh, it's the case, you have to understand the science. You cannot memorize it. And she mentions this in, in her discussion. She says sometimes people just memorize immense quantities of data. That's not what we should do. We should understand why things are formed. We should understand mathematics. We should understand the geometry of the spheres rather than just memorize them by heart. And I think this is where the hard part goes. Yeah, I, I agree, but I think the internet is a wonderful resource for that now because, I mean, it is full of pseudoscience and opinionated crap, forgive my language, um, but as an online repository, as an online memory, and I use the net as my memory for everything, oh, yes. it allows so much more time to understand the, the science behind it and the linkages between things. I wouldn't, I don't know where I'd be without things like um, Wikipedia is a horrible example, but I... It is I, a good example. <laughs> it's where you start. Yeah, it's uh, and just having the knowing that I don't have to know everything, I have to understand it, makes everything else so much simpler. Um, Alison is is by the way uh, an avid biology teacher who promotes understanding of fundamentals rather than memorizing uh, these factoids and trying to stick them together. But on the on the converse of that, sometimes it's quite useful to have a few memorized facts because it does allow you. Uh, and it, certain things help me to remember. For instance, those numbers of stars in the universe. Uh, sorry, in, in our galaxy that we mentioned before. Memorizing that fact allows me to extrapolate and, and figure out a whole bunch of the science that is, is not always on oh, the top of my head. Absolutely, we have to memorize things, but once we understand them, it's so much easier to 
take all that information on board because it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And um, speaking of generating new knowledge, uh, Haritina, you're also head of the Kiwi Mars project. I am the commander. This year, Commander Haritina. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a wee bit about this? Because this is seriously cool science that's going on within New Zealand. In April 21st, we will start New Zealand's first expedition to the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah, USA. Now, this is a place of miracle, a place of wonder that belongs to the Mars Society and institutions like NASA and the European Space Agency, ESA, and a lot of other institutions of the kind space-related around the world are sending their scientists there to study how it feels, how it is to live on Mars, how it is to live in confined environments such as the ones from Antarctica, it's a very good comparison, and how it feels to be united together in this amazing goal of promoting science and, and scientific research. And um, I had the um, amazing chance to go there in 2011, I was sent by the Romanian Space Agency. and. I've been uh, doing a lot of uh, talks ever since I came back. I talked to about um, um, lots of schools, 15 schools in Wellington, about 1,200 students, uh, 1,600 people in total in New Zealand. And they all asked me the same thing. What was your favorite part from, from being at the Mars Desert Research Station um, last year? And the favorite thing was when I saw the doors. There are doors in there where people left their names on, and there are people from all over the world, from all cultures, from all beliefs, from all, I don't know, everything you can imagine in this world has been represented in those rooms. People went through, through there, and they all have one goal, and that is science education, proper science education, as, as, as accurate as we can get it. And this is amazing. That's the most amazing thing, because people need goals to survive as, as humankind we need goals and I think this is a magnificent goal to go to Mars to promote life to to become a space very civilization it's absolutely fantastic so so the, getting down to the nitty-gritty of what you actually do is that um, so yourself and a team of how many six people in total six scientists six people Go over to this Mars Desert Research Station in Utah, and it's a little self-contained module that sits smack bang in the middle of the desert yeah, it's, with it's nothing around, around it. Yeah, it's a round um, a hab. We call it a <laughs> hab. And they, they, they said that is the uh, actual hab they're going to send to Mars when they're going to have the uh, mission. So we're kind of living in the um, – oh, what's the name in English? In the simulation of a hab that is going to go to Mars. And it says in the middle of the desert, there is nothing as we know it human as, uh, or Earth-like, That, if you wish. A lot of the science fiction movies that have been done around the world have been done in the Utah desert because it just looks so alien. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it r reminds me that the beautiful pictures, and um, again, we'll we'll link to the to the main site if you want to find out more information about this or have a look at some of the photos from the pre-existing missions. Oh, They're please, amazing. absolutely, absolutely, because what we want to do is to have this powerful outreach section, and that's what we're working towards. So we'll go there, six people, for two weeks. We present we're on Mars. We wear spacesuits every time we go outside of the hub. We take samples. We analyze the samples, and we report back to the people and the public from New Zealand. So this whole expedition, the two weeks, will be a outreach, a continuous outreach mission, and um, we will be interacting li live with the cruise. Carter Observatory is going to be the mission control. Kids will be able to come to Carter Observatory, students, uh, public, to to talk to us, to ask how it, does it feel to carry the the weight of the spacesuit for, for two or three or four hours or whatever we will be out in, in doing the mission. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm I'm supremely jealous. <laughs> I must say, one of the cool things that um, that I didn't think of that you've told me about in our conversations is this delay you have with all your communications to represent what you'd have on Mars. Yes, we will. Uh, we would have a delay. So Mars is as close as three minutes from Earth, three light minutes from Earth, or as far away as twenty 
uh, light minutes from Earth. So the any any correspondence, any uh, transmission will have this delay. And one of the nice things is that the students will be able to calculate the actual the current position of Mars. And they will be able to calculate for themselves how long would it take for the uh, communication to occur. And we will incorporate that into a software that will make the communication. So uh, we'll have to wait our turn. And it is quite close. Fortunately, Mars will be quite close to Earth. In uh, April will be very, very close. So, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that as well. So you won't have to wait too long to watch online TV or no, check no, and, trade me. and people will have to um, to ponder their questions very um, uh, to make them very clear, so that um, they won't take too much bandwidth. And okay, so so you you're going you're, you're spending two weeks in the desert. You're going to be doing a bunch of research when you're over there. What's after that, after you've done the actual mission and you return to the land of the living, you return to New Zealand, what, what then? Um, we have this outreach project that we're working towards, we are architecting at present, and there are institutions like the Royal Society of New Zealand and LEARNS and Carter Observatory and, and a lot of other people who are interested in uh, producing um, these resources. What we wish is to be able to produce resources for the planet Earth and beyond curriculum. So we will be working at those. We would be interested to find out from people, from teachers, from students, what would their interest be in, in this mission. And we want to have an outreach program after the expedition that would probably stretch up to the World Space Week. So then we um, triumphantly um, ending it in, uh, on, on uh, 4th of October. So we will be interacting with schools. We will go and have public talks and... Um, yeah, you're going to be doing a great deal of education, and uh, hopefully That's get enough support and funding to keep doing it in the future. It's such an important endeavour. It's lovely to see someone from New Zealand doing it and running the whole mission herself. Yay. So congratulations, Thank you. Harry. Um, and just finally today, as as we noted earlier on, we're missing our usual co-host, and that's because she is over in Melbourne at a camp called the Ada Camp, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, Amy's going to give me an earful if I don't, so I might edit this out. But what it is, it's an event that brings together people interested in issues facing women in open technology and culture. So what Amy's been doing is she's gone over there to chat to all the techy, sciencey, cool chicks over in Melbourne, and uh, she's got a few interesting interviews, so take it away, Amy. Hi, Oz. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, well, and, and Harry as well. It's Amy here. I've just come back from the inaugural ADA Camp, um, A-D-A-C-A-M-P, which was held in Melbourne this year. Now, ADA Camp is run by um, a, a relatively new organization called ADA Initiative, which is all about supporting women in uh, science and tech and, and the technical fields, um, engineering, et cetera, et cetera, because I, I, I imagine, as many of us know, certainly in, in the West, it's uh, these tend to be pretty sort of male-dominated industries. Um, yeah, so, so really cool. Uh, the Ada Initiative guys were kind enough to be able to help me out with covering some of the costs of, of being over there, which was sort of really useful. Otherwise, Melbourne is, is quite a far way to go for uh, a day. But the unconference is really interesting. It brought together uh, women not only from Australia, but a couple of us from New Zealand and, and also from further afield as well uh, to, to talk about these issues as, as part of an unconference, so an, a, an unstructured conference where one doesn't go to listen to prescribed speakers, but everybody comes up with the topics amongst themselves on the day and then sort of talks through, talks through issues and questions that they might have. Um, so the women ranged from uh, people involved in the humanities, uh, people involved in librarianship, people involved in radio shows, and so forth, to people like me who are very interested in uh, sort of science-related matters. And then also um, a, a number of the women there were very involved in various uh, coding, so software-related um, industries. A lot of them are, are coders themselves. And uh, yeah, it was, it was super, super fascinating just to hear how varied people's experiences have been of, of working in male-dominated um, industries. Some of them have been positive, some of them unfortunately have been very negative. And so much of the day was, was spent talking about sort of how we can uh, support each other, 
how we can uh, sort of spread the word uh, about not being sexist, how we can talk to younger people uh, as well about it. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it was, it was really good. Unfortunately, I can't talk hugely at the moment about uh, the subject matter that was covered since it was done under, under Chatham House rules. And we're still amongst us all waiting to finalize sort of what people feel comfortable with sharing uh, and what they don't, just, just because of some of the experiences and things that were shared were, were very personal and some of the viewpoints um, that were shared were very, were very personal. But uh, yeah, do, do keep a listen out, listeners. Um, what I'll be doing is uh, covering sort of any projects and things that come out of this, considering it's in the science and tech industries. Um, and sort of if, if you are interested in the initiative, if you're interested in uh, the work that they're involved in, the projects that, that they're involved in. And uh, also if you're wondering if they're going to be in your area because they are planning to hold an ADA camp once or twice a year for as long as they can um, in various places around the world. Do you go and check out the website. It's adainitiative.org. And uh, for anybody who's wondering why the name Ada sounds familiar, it's uh, named for Ada Lovelace, who is a genius mathematician uh, quite, quite some time ago and, and possibly one of the more famous sort of uh, scientific, female scientific uh, luminaries that we have. But uh, yeah, signing out, I'll be back online next week in full steam uh, talking about research and interesting things that have happened in the week. And in the meantime, uh, enjoy. All right, that was fantastic. Thanks for that, Amy. And just to finish up, uh, there's not too much in the way of events this week. There is, however, a botanizing summer camp held up in Taranaki. You can find, again, more info, uh, and that starts on Friday. You can find more info about dates, times, locations, pricing, and all that jazz uh, in the show notes associated with this post. And just to finish up, we have to say thanks to everyone who contributes to this podcast. So uh, thanks to State Shirt and Rian Sheehan for our opening and closing themes, respectively, and to Cybloggers and the and Cyblogs for providing us with stories and discussion topics and rants. You can subscribe to TOSP via iTunes. You can follow or listen via YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash user slash Cyblogs podcast. Or you can follow our RSS feed at cyblogs.co.nz slash TOSP. Or you can watch us on the Zill and the Cool Science channel. Or you can find us and other quality science podcasts like World Space Week podcast uh, at sciencepodcasters.org if you've got any questions comments or suggestions just chuck something up on the TOSP blog and if you like us we'd really appreciate you writing a review and rating the podcast on iTunes because it helps us get up onto the front page or you can just share a link to this week's podcast via Twitter or Facebook or anything else so you can help other people find us too you can follow Cyblogs posts by subscribing to emails or Twitter or RSS or by visiting the Cyblogs homepage at cyblogs.co.nz and if you like we'd appreciate you helping to support the site by getting decked out in awesome Cyblogs apparel, which you can get at zazzle.com slash A-I-M-E-E-M-W. Uh, you can follow Amy and myself uh, via Twitter, which is T-H underscore A-I-M-E-E, or Kai Wata, K-A-I-W-H-A-T-A, or via our respective Cyblogs. Otherwise, from myself and the TOSP crew, stay curious, and thanks for joining us, Haratina. See you on Mars. See ya.